next guest is a gentleman who we've had here before. Mr. Neil Murata is CEO of Indiva Limited, not Indiva. If you've been saying Indiva, you've been wrong. It's Indiva. Okay, we're clear on that. Indiva trades on the TSX Venture under the symbol NDVA. Neil, welcome back. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, Neil, this market has been kind to some, brutal to others. It looks to me, looking at your chart, that you really haven't got the lift that I sense in my bones is coming your way. Yeah, thank you for that. I agree. We haven't got the lift, and I think it is on the way. Yeah. Uh, so tell me, what's going to make it happen? What's going to make it fly? What's going to drive right. it to the moon? Well, topical to today, well, a couple of things. Last time we were here, we said we would uh, get our sales license. We did get that in August. Uh, so we'll start onboarding patients. Thank you. We'll mm -hmm. start onboarding patients this quarter, uh, which is great. We'll start generating some revenue. I think at that point, people will see we have a real company, not just a stock. Right. Uh, the other thing that we've done uh, is we've gone and licensed uh, award-winning and disruptive brands in the United States, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, hopefully uh, in this interview. One mm -hmm. is uh, called Bang. We have a joint venture with Bang. Uh, they make award-winning a uh, Bang chocolate. They make yeah, live life with Boy, a Bang. Is there? That. Uh, that's right. <laughs> yes, but it's spelled B-H-A-N-G, and oh, uh, we that's have a, actually pronounced Bong. Correct. There's yeah, pronunciation yeah. issues well, in this industry. Yeah, I'm going to stay not wade into those waters, okay. but uh, we have a joint you venture bang, with them. I'll say Bong. Right. Okay, joint venture, and what do yeah. they do? Uh, so they, the joint venture will have the exclusive rights 50-50 here in Canada and, and the joint JV will hold the exclusive right to manufacture and distribute all of Bang's products which are award winning in the states. Uh, so that includes chocolates, uh, vape pens. Uh, Cannabis infused. Absolutely, yes. Okay. CBD, THC, all of the above. Uh, they also do oral sprays and isolates, gums, candies. So we're really happy that we're going to hit the ground running once edibles are allowed, so within right. the next year or so, with a word So you're positioning product. for that inevitability. Absolutely, yeah. Ah. The other thing we've done, James, is we licensed another brand out of Seattle called uh, Ruby, a company called Deep Cell, a newer company. Uh, but what they've done is found a way to mechanically fuse cannabinoids with crystalline structures like sugar and salt. They call them flexible edibles. We're starting to call them choose your own adventure edibles, <laughs> where you're, we're not saying eat this piece of chocolate or eat this candy or drink this drink, but rather add sugar or salt to your favorite foods, you know, french fries, oh. veggies, coffee, tea. Uh, oh. and so, yeah, so flexible edibles. We're really excited oh. to bring those products to so Canada. So cannabis infused sweeteners and salts. That absolutely. That makes yep. absolute brilliant sense to me. So let me just recap, and I apologize if I'm re repeating yourself, but <laughs> I'm a little slow today. Uh, so you are licensing successful brands in the United States into Canada. Yes. And for the inevitable Canadian acceptance and provision for the consumption of all of these different things that don't currently exist. That's right, yeah. So that explains why it's your share price hasn't taken off because everybody's like waiting, waiting. Yeah, I, I think people are sort of relating uh, productive capacity to revenue and market share. Right. I think what we're saying is, look, there's a lot of capacity coming online here. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have high quality flowers. We'll produce 3,000 kilos a year out of our facility in London. Mm -hmm. We're also very excited to have farm gate sales. I actually have a retail store at our facility in London. Wow. Uh, it's in an urban location. It's across the street from a wholesale club. There are nine hotels uh, with, it, with over a thousand rooms within a half mile walk of the facility. Uh, we're a minute from the 401, uh, just right near Wellington, the 401 in London. Uh, and we, we're the only licensed producer that's operating in London right now. Really? So we think we have a nice, let's say, first mover advantage, at least in, in the mind share of, of Londoners, who also know Pete Young very well. I mean, he's served thousands of patients there for two decades now. Okay, so, uh, you know, the branding, we're actually rolling the portions of the website right now on the... Oh, great. Uh, the branding looks really, really slick and really, like, I, I see a lot of marijuana company websites, as you can imagine, and some of them are more like, uh, I don't know, I don't want to sound condescending, but some of them are just less sophisticated than others when it comes to the graphics and the colors and the, and the fonts and everything. I got to say, I'm loving what I'm seeing on uh, Indiva's site. So you almost said Thank Indiva you. again. Uh, that's great. Thank you. We have cool. a great marketing team. They've done a great work. Yeah. yeah. So how is it them. that, uh, so Pete Young is a bit of a famous guy in this whole mix and he's, he's kind of like the brand ambassador for Indiva? Yeah, to a certain extent. Yeah. I mean, he's still involved in the operations to a certain extent, but uh, absolutely the knowledge that he has, uh, particularly his roots in the compassion industry. And actually, uh, Pete has written a book 
uh, called The High Road, Journey from the Black Market to the Stock Market. This book's been picked up by Indigo and Amazon, and it'll be hmm. released on October 17th. So, oh, uh, yeah, that's an appropriate date. You know, absolutely. Coincidence? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think so. I'm very happy to have him on the team, too. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Well, hopefully, maybe we can get him on the show on October 17th. It's going to be a fun-filled day. Yeah, we'll, we'll try. Yeah. Uh, if he's out there watching, you're invited, Pete. Right. You're invited, <laughs> Pete. Come, Pete. Come. Anyways, uh, I look forward to meeting Pete one day, and I look forward to uh, sampling these great products. Now, so tell me at this point, uh, what's keeping Indiva moving forward in terms of, like, have you raised a bunch of money? Are you still access to capital is good, cost of capital is acceptable, mm -hmm. lots of investor support? Yeah, so we, we still have over $25 million of cash on the balance sheet, so our expansion to 40,000 square feet is, is fully funded uh, and leave ample cash left over where we hope to get to profitability. Mm -hmm. uh, we've raised close to $50 million to date, which is, let's say, on the lower end of, of the industry as a whole, but again, we're not chasing uh, grow capacity, and uh, so we don't measure our business in square feet or acres. What we're after are great brands where we can capture market share, <coughs> and inevitably what we think will be the half of the market that's going to have higher margins. When you look at mature markets, uh, it's really the edibles and derivatives and, and other products, the non-smokable products, let's say, that, that take big market share. Having great brands, and we think brands roll east and north. And right. so something that's successful in California wins awards, we think will do fine. I don't like science experiments, so I like the idea of hitting the ground uh, running with award-winning product like Bang or sure. uh, really disruptive stuff like the flexible edibles like Ruby. Okay, I have a question for you, and this is an issue that I've become to be aware of. Um, I'm curious as to when it comes to the idea of cannabis as ingredients in edibles, consumable products, there's been a problem with the stability of the cannabinoid content over time in, in terms of shelf life and stability in that cannabinoids are subject to deterioration or concentration True. through different influences like the fats and acids that might be present in drinks and food mm -hmm. or by sunlight in certain display locations. So how do you address the issue of a shelf life for those products and is that some, a problem that you've already solved? Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not something that's been brought to our attention by our partners as a, as a, a crucial issue that's sink mm. or swim, so to speak. Uh, certainly with the dry flowers, uh, if you use a nitrogen flush and hermetically seal the packaging, you'll extend the, the shelf life. You're right, the cannabinoids do dissipate over time, so there is a bit of a half-life, like many you know, products that are out there already. So I think that's inventory, smart inventory management. And the real difference, and part of what we also like about the edible uh, scene, uh, is that we don't have to wait 10 weeks, let's say, for the flowers to grow and come out. So we can adjust, let's say, our production so that we're not having a lot of stale inventory on the shelves. Okay. So are you going to, you're going to produce the products here under license from these brands? Correct. Okay. And so you're going to obviously adhere to the strict testing regime that Health Canada demands for both recreational and medical products. That's right. Yeah, we already are subject to those rules. We use third-party testing. Uh, hopefully, uh, let's say we've been told sort of by early winter, late fall, we should have some guidance from Health Canada on uh, how the edibles will be, let's say, concentrations and packaging and things like this. So mm -hmm. we eagerly await those rules and absolutely we'll make our, our products compliant. Sure. Do you have an idea as to the addressable market for the edible segment of cannabinoids in Canada? Well, we have uh, data from the United States in more mature markets where, let's say, roughly half of the market is dry flour that's either smoked or vape, uh, and then the other half would be what we call derivative products broadly, and that would include edibles, uh, vape pens. Uh, edibles are upwards of 15 to 20 percent uh, market share, vape pens sort of 10 to 15. Mm -hmm. uh, then you've got this category of concentrates, uh, whether it's waxes and shatters that are sort of the 5 to 10 percent range. Uh, so we think there are very large and uh, big markets that, uh, let's say, are underserved relative to uh, the amount of dry flour that's going to get produced in, in this country. So we're excited to, let's say, aim at those markets as our, our main focus. Okay. Um, shatter, in particular, is it now, and again, nomenclature in this industry is very sort of fractured and regionalized. So um, shatter to most people, most demographics, indicate a concentrate of THC above 80%. Is that accurate in your understanding? Uh, I, so I'm a novice with some of these terms as well, so I, I don't want to speak to the percentage, okay. but it is, that sounds about right to me. It is really, really high concentrated, almost right. a pure THC. In sure. A, in Do you a, think those levels of concentrates are ever actually going to be allowed in Canada? Uh, I'm not sure, to be totally honest with you. Uh, I think 
if the goal is to eradicate the illicit market, there's going to have to be some allowance for it. That's mm -hmm. not necessarily our focus. It's part of the category I was describing, but uh, these extremely potent uh, products, uh, that's not, let's say, our number one focus. But uh, the margins will presumably be very good there. Uh, there is obviously a demand uh, for these products when we look at mature markets or even in the illicit market. So uh, one way or another, it'll be addressed. Um, you know, in the context of public safety, sure. Sure. So what then would be your distribution strategy for these products in Canada? Obviously, there's going to be licensing issues or licensed locations. Have you got agreements with uh, physical stores or ACMPR producers who might include your products on their shelves? Yeah, so we're in discussions with several of the large retailers that are rolling out stores, and the feedback on our branding and our product lines has been very good. So stay tuned on that. Uh, we haven't yet achieved any um, offtake agreements with wholesalers, mainly because we just got our sales license uh, in late August. Mm. Uh, so we're new to this. But those discussions are also ongoing with organizations like the OCS and Liquor Distribution Branch in BC. So stay tuned. We would expect that to, to happen in the short to medium term. Right. All right, Neil, that's a great update. Um, what else has happened in the, uh, in the sort of the news universe that has sort of added to the value since the last time you were here? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, going back to what we talked about earlier, the, the change in retail, we had made an announcement that we'd like to open retail stores. Uh, we're waiting to see legislation to understand how we can do that with affiliates. But uh, the, the official announcement that we can do farm gate sales, again, this is, this is hugely beneficial for us in terms of, let's say, existential risk to the company. We know that we'll have, uh, we're a small market cap, 65 million, not 6.5 billion. Uh, so one really successful store at our facility makes a huge impact on mm -hmm. our future profitability and our access to, to the market. And London, you know, it's upwards of half a million people uh, when school's in session, so to speak. So uh, not a tiny uh, market by any stretch. Uh, and also our location, you know, whether it's people going towards Toronto or away from Toronto, being right off the 401, we think there's huge potential there as well. Uh, we think also there's opportunity to extend our brand into European markets and also into Asia. And, uh, that's the one uh, piece of the pie we thought we'd have in place uh, by now, but uh, stay tuned. We're, we're working pretty hard on that as well. Right. Uh, okay, so the, you've got dispensaries planned. What do you make of the uh, Ontario Provincial Premier Doug Ford's uh, plan stated to take the cannabis industry in the province private? Do you think that's a realistic statement that can happen in the near future? I think so. Yeah, I mean, there's absolutely a lot of appetite uh, from folks that want to open stores, mm -hmm. open retail stores. Oh, well, I'd like uh, to open one. <laughs> Got a website. There you go. Why <laughs> so, can't I sell weed? Yeah, I, I, I look at it as, uh, the f and also, most importantly, there's no limit on the number of stores. Right. I think this will help uh, price, uh, help, uh, let's say, it may hurt the retail margins somewhat, uh, but, you know, the more stores, the better in terms of, let's say, stealing market share from the real incumbent, which is the illicit market. Mm -hmm. uh, also, act more access points is better for us. Uh, and better for other LPs uh, selling their products. So uh, I think on balance, it was a very good announcement. Uh, would be nice if we could open uh, our own Farmgate store a little sooner than April 1st. Right. Uh, we'll see what happens in this sort of six-month period. But, uh, you know, my assumption is that people are doing the best job that they can. So we think on balance, it's a favorable change, a favorable announcement. Right. Okay. Uh, Neil, let's leave it there. We'll come back to you in a quarter's time and keep following the story. I'm Great. looking forward to October 17th, as I'm sure you are. <laughs>